So, it's a great pleasure to be here. And so many people, wonderful. So, today, I will take you to a very special adventure, to a time travel adventure. You are the hero of this adventure, and you have the power to decide in which future we will live. But let's start first. We're writing the year 2050. The food supply has collapsed. Heat wave after heat wave, flood after flood, disease after disease have ruined global harvest. After seeing your whole production destroyed by a pathogen that killed within days your whole greenhouse, you decide to take action. You have enough, the smell of rotten tomato in your nose, you go back home, start your computer. And you see, you start analyzing what, what went wrong. You, you really see something at some point has gone horribly wrong. We have missed something. And then you realize it started 30 years ago. 30 years ago, people were starting really to destroy the last bits of, of nature in, in, in an attempt to feed mankind. And mankind, despite of all this disease, trying to find new plots that will not have disease. And they destroyed more and more until nothing was left. So this is the point where you land and you think, OK, I have to do something. You think. And then you do what every sensible person would do in that context. You take your time machine, jump into your time machine, and go back in 2021. Say, so, okay, this is the moment where things started to go wrong. And there you step off, and instead of the scorched earth of the future, a breeze, a fresh breeze is caressing your face. Green, healthy plants are all around you. But you don't have time to, to contemplate this beautiful nature. You know that this is one of the last years where this will be possible. So you go to work. And you start looking at plants, trying to figure out what is going wrong, what, what may keep plants healthy. You look and search and look closer and closer until suddenly you found it. You notice that these plants are not alone. Any plant is just covered by billions of bacteria. And these bacteria have the power to change agriculture. I pass you some of them. You can have a look. Maybe you can pass to the row behind you. You can look at them, smell them. Don't lick them, please. We still are in the pandemics. So, and you see, all these bacteria are. are here, any plants is covered with them. Inside the plants, you have, you, you have a soup of bacteria. And you find that many of them might hold the power to keep plants healthy. Many of them, as you see here, can just keep pathogens, this kind of gray, gray mold growing here. When you have bacteria on the, around, this mold will not be able to grow. Potentially, this may be the key for a sustainable and productive agriculture. And you go and you add them to plants and then you discover incredible things. That some of these bacteria are bad, but many of them, if you add them to plants, you just make them grow like crazy. So is this the solution? Is it the way of making a better agriculture? You think a bit more and then you realize, ah, in fact, it is long for a long time. So that bacteria are here. So, full of hope, you take your bacteria from your petri dish, throw them into a giant bioreactor, and let them grow, multiply them, get billions of billions of them, throw them on your field, and nothing happens. Nothing happens. These bacteria die before they can reach anything, and you're very sad because this promising result that works so well in the lab becomes such a disappointment in the field. But then you try to find a solution, and you go to your friend who is a plant ecologist, and he tells you, hey, you know, of course it cannot work. Look, the sun is not a sterile thing. You saw it yourself when analyzing plants. You have dozens, hundreds, thousands of bacterial species living in the soil. 
And what matters here in the exper example uh, Jena experiment in Germany, on, on which we have worked with our colleagues also, showing that basically it doesn't matter who is present. It doesn't matter if plant A or B or bacteria A and B is present. What is relevant is how they work as a team, as a community. And then you scratch a bit the back of your mind and say, whoa, that sounds complicated. But you're a smart guy, so, or a smart person, so you find the solution, you find ways to, to really tweak this whole community of, of microbes. You develop new computer tools that allow you to screen these microbes and automatically boost them as, as a community. And for that, you isolate more and more microbes and look at what they can do, if they can kill pathogens, if they can play with each other, help each other, if they can affect the plants. And you discover that some microbes can boost the root growth, allowing plants to take up nu more nutrients. Some other make the plants resistant to disease. Some other make the plants resistant to drought. You discover it's an infinite world of properties. And finally, after years of work, just in time for the next mega huge heat wave, you find a way to make plants resistant. And this is possible because you have so many so many bacteria around. You have a genetic pool that is infinite. All these bacteria here have been isolated from one single plant. And this is just a tiny fraction of all the biodiversity that you have on a plant. So imagine out of all these species pool, if you can harness the useful one, you have the solution. Full of hope, you go back to lab, you create new compute new solution, and you manage to find just the right treatment that will boost the native biodiversity. Discover which microbes are good for the plants and give them a boost. And this just works fantastically. So you go to your friends who are organic farmers and other friends, and, uh, and this farmer tells you, yeah, you know, I'm adding compost every day to my soil on the top here, but the plants are still diseased. And she's very despaired. But you tell her, look, I know why. It's because this treatment that you added is just feeding the disease and not helping the plants. And you go back to your computer and compute exactly the right set of, uh, of prebiotic, like, like in the prebiotic you take for your health. That will just boost the right set of microbes that are here in the soil, just waiting to be activated. And then you get a healthy and plentiful uh, yield. So I know you say, okay, I help one farmer, let's go back to the future. And you treat your greenhouse that was previously destroyed, you replant the plant, but also take care of the microbes and you obtain again a plenty of tomatoes that this time are not foul, they are just delicious and you, you pluck one bite in it, and just relax, enjoying the taste. All of this, of course, is a very romanticized version of the work of what thousands and thousands of people worldwide are doing. We are now, in, in, in my, my colleagues and myself, I hear mentioning also a lot of work made by my wonderful colleagues in China, in the Netherlands, and these are our small steps but each of these small steps take us closer. And recently we discovered that we have done so much work that now we can really help the farmers and growers to get a sustainable yield while cutting down the use of pesticides and fertilizer. And if you are interested in this topic, if you too want to use microbes to make harvests, to make agriculture sustainable, I invite you to join our team, join our efforts. Thank you very much. <laughs>